Thank you for joining this incredible live stream event. We will be starting in five minutes. In the meantime, while you wait, please check out our store table located in the foyer of Revived Church or in our online store at olivetreeviews.org. We are a moment, you are forever. Lord of the ages, God before time. We are a vapor, you are eternal. Love everlasting, reigning on high. brave people. 
We have a Minnesota snowstorm. Actually, it quit about noon today. For those of you listening online, we welcome you as well. I am Jan Markell. None of this would happen without the wonderful people, crew, and pastors here at Revived Church, starting with Pastor Mark Henry. Well, welcome, friends. It's a great joy to gather together in Jesus' name. And, uh, you know, I just want to ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? I mean, let's start with a question tonight. Those of you who are online, uh, we want to ask you this question as well. Do you believe, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on the cross and rose again the third day? Do you believe that he's seated at the right hand of God right now? Do you believe he's coming back for you? And friends, it can be at any time. Any time. In fact, what I want you to do is turn someone and say, any time. Go ahead and tell them. Shout it out online. Any time. Any time. You got to be ready. In fact, you might be watching. You might be sitting here, and you're not ready. Listen, you need to be ready because Jesus is coming. Now, I want to give a special shout out to our uh, stream parties that are happening around the country, north, south, east, west. Uh, Other countries, we want to welcome you tonight. Our underground uh, churches, again, scattered throughout. We love you. We're glad that you're joining us online tonight. And also our friends throughout the Commonwealth, and specifically our friends who we've been praying for uh, in New Zealand. Congratulations on your leadership change. (laughs) So bless you. Bless you. I, I just wanted to share that tonight. Now, hey, make sure your phones are off if you're in the room. We're going to have a pretty simple program tonight. Jan's going to introduce our guest. We're going to have a discussion panel, and then we're going to have a Q&A session. So I want to encourage you. There's going to be a phone number that pops up. Text your questions there. Uh, the subject tonight is going to lend itself. So wherever you're at in the world, you can go ahead and text us. We're going to try and answer as many of those questions as possible, especially the personal ones uh, about your sp- spiritual journey and, and resisting Satan and, and honoring God. Uh, we're going to try and get to as many of those as possible. And then Jan and I may follow up. Brandon will follow up in other ways uh, down the road. So with that, Jan, would you introduce our speaker? Got to know Pastor Brandon Holthouse a number of years ago. Privileged to speak at his church um, almost three years to the day, January 2020. Bakersfield, California, Rock Harbor Church. Many of you follow him online, which is great. And, um, you know, feel sorry for Pastor. He just left California, Okay. <laughs> At least we got the snow to stop, but I was really concerned this morning. I get out, and there's a snowstorm going on, and my guest is coming from California, and I'm afraid he's going to turn into an icicle, and and he made it. And um, we are going to tackle, if you heard the radio programming with him a couple weeks ago, he's going to open with some comments related to that. What is that, if you didn't hear it? Basically, believers today are being attacked like, like never before in ways that are spooky and even creepy. The, 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 the enemy is angry. He knows the Bible well enough to know. His days are very, very numbered. And so he's trying to make an impact while he can. And he's trying to harass Christians. Brandon's going to talk about that. He's going to tell you what to be looking for and how to do battle. Then we're going to come up here, and we're going to broaden the discussion. You all know what's meeting as we speak, World Economic Forum. They're planning global government. They're laying out Revelation 13 as we speak, Klaus Schwab and company. It is a very, very serious thing that's going on in Davos. We're going to talk about that up here for for as much time as we have. We'll be here to answer some questions that you'll be submitting. And without any taking any more time, Pastor Brandon, please come on out, won't you? Bakersfield. (laughs) When I invited him, I said, it's January 19th, not July 19th. January 19th. I think you guys are trying to kill me or something, man, coming from California. He came anyway. (laughs) Well, hey, thank you guys for having me, and yes, it is cold to me. I am freezing. 
It's so cold, I bought a frozen pizza today, and I had to put it in the freezer to warm it up. That's how cold it is. I also went to Walmart today, and it was so cold, I saw people wearing two sets of pajamas to go to Walmart. And I talked to Jan this morning, and it was so cold, she told me her cats delivered and had mittens instead of kittens. It was so cold. That's when you know it's cold. I'm not used to this, so uh, we got thin blood out in California. But what I'm about to talk to you guys about will uh, raise eyebrows and raise your blood pressure just a little bit. So I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to prepare you and tell you kind of what's going on. And what we're starting to see in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of areas across the country, and especially the feedback that I'm getting um, from our church tracker and all kinds of people around the world, is we're seeing an increase. It's not just demonic levels of activity happening in the world. That's a given. We're seeing an increase in harassment of Bible-believing Christians. And then the question comes to us, why? Why is that happening? Because people will approach me and say, I'm not messing with the occult. I'm not even involved in that. I'm as far away as I possibly can be, and yet this harassment is starting to happen. What, ha what kinds of harassment am I talking about? I'll go into more depth, but we're talking about um, the type of harassment that comes in dreams, and it's more than a dream. It's real. It's a harassment dream where the person is being persecuted by creatures or villains or whatever, or even sexually assaulted in the dream. We're also seeing many, many Christians have what we call sleep paralysis, but it's not sleep paralysis, it's demonic paralysis, where they're being pinned down on the ground. We have many uh, Christians reporting to me that you have these dark uh, figures in front of their bed that appear to them at night and creep them out, and what is that? Even it's affecting children as well of believers. It's happening everywhere. And it's, it's something that I wasn't really prepared for. We've always known demonic activity is happening. We've always known that. But I didn't realize it would start in these last days affecting the remnant. And that's what got me by surprise. So what I want to relate to you is a reality that's happening. And this reality has to be understood so we know how to fight it, know how to resist it, know how to deal with it. Because the key is this. They want to shut you up. They want to silence you. Because it's getting too close and you're the only one out there that knows the prophetic scenario and can connect dots for people. And they do not want you connecting dots. They do not want you telling them about Davos. They do not want you telling them about the transgender thing. And because of that, it's, it's a cause to silence the remnant before they're raptured. So let's start with what's really going on. So here's a typical email that we get. Okay? So what the guy is talking to us about in the email is that his own child is being demonically harassed. Now, there's nothing going on in the family, God-fearing Christian people. And the, the, the harassment starts with the child. And this will surprise a lot of people. That sometimes they'll go after our own kids. See, the devil doesn't play fair. So any chance they get, they'll, they'll attack the family at the weakest point. And typically, sometimes it's through children. In this case, this father has been dealing with his child that is manifesting demonic activity around him. I'm not saying the child's possessed, but uh, um, he could be oppressed. Okay? When you look at oppression, and I'll get to that later, oppression manifests similar things to possession. I don't believe a believer can be possessed, but they can be oppressed. And this is what you see in this, this is an email that he sent to us. This morning, when Noah woke up, his demeanor was uncannily awed. We wound up sending him to his room until he settled down and he started being disruptive and yelling up there. I went to help to calm him down and I realized I was standing face to face with a demon. 
I put Noah in my lap as we sat on the bed, and I said, Noah, you are a child of God, bought by the blood of Jesus. Confess him as your Lord with me. By this time, my wife was with me, and this is a general synopsis of the conversation, of our conversation. So he says, this was me. Noah, confess Jesus as your Lord with me. No, shut up. Noah Reeves, you love Jesus. You know Jesus loves you. No, I hate Jesus. You are not welcome here and must leave. Noah, shut up. Shut the blank up. Because demons typically cuss. Me, this is a child of the Most High God who has confessed Jesus, the Christ, as his Lord and been baptized. He is sealed by the Holy Spirit. You have no authority over him. Leave. No, I won't. Shut up. I am his father, and Noah is my son. I have authority over him. You do not. Now go. No, you don't. Go away. Me. No. You must leave and never return. You are vanquished and a liar. Go in the name of Jesus. Shut up. Me. Noah Reeves, you are a child of Almighty God. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. About this point, Noah looks up at me, and I saw a complete change in his countenance. He looks at me, and in his normal six-year-old voice says, Can we go downstairs and watch TV now? The unclean, harassing spirit left our home. Now, amen, this father dealt with it appropriately. But we're seeing more and more of this happen to solid Bible-believing Christians. Why? So let's trace it. Let's go from a global understanding and narrow it down to you and I. Because if you haven't dealt with it, you will. And I must prepare you for it. Because they want to silence you, okay? So the big ticket item, we know that a spiritual vacuum has been created in America and around the world. They're basically kicking Christianity out of America, making us persona non grata. You know that. We're the Christian white nationalists. We're the racist, the homophobic. You name it, we're, we're the problem. Okay? So this vacuum has been created as they've kicked Christianity out of America and around the world. What has filled it, though? The whore of Babylon. The whore has come in to fill it with a cultic revival, pagan spirituality, new age, Hindu practices, and wokeism. And you all know about that, right? So this is starting on the cultural level. More and more people are attracted to it. And as Lord, the Lord said, the principle is, once the, level, the leaven is introduced in the loaf, it permeates the entire loaf. We're watching a society where the leaven was introduced a long time ago, and now it's permeated. It's taking over our culture, right? We're seeing now unprecedented rebellion to God in all categories of sin, design, right? design of God, we're seeing it in theology and morals. And as the, the Bible mentions, for rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. We're watching this. And our society is getting more demonic. Look, man, there's times when I look at these people on TV, and I look in their eyes, because the eyes will tell you there's something wrong with the eyes, isn't there? They have this like thousand yard stare, and you're looking straight into their eyes, it's like pitch blackness. I'm seeing that with the talking heads and the political pundits. What is that about? It's demonic. Whether they're oppressed or possessed, I don't know. But a lot of these people in our culture, when I look at George Soros, I look at demonic activity. When I look at Yuval Harari, demonic activity. Klaus Schwab, demonic activity. Every time I look at the guy, there's something there, right? And we know this culturally. Anyway, What's happened also, you know this, the radical and militant LGBT agenda is being foisted on all of our, all of our kids in the, in the school programs, right? They're, they're grooming our kids, these public school teachers. And it's across the board. In California, this is the norm. I don't know how much it is here in Minnesota, but it's coming your way because whatever happens in California, it goes east. And now we have this whole new paradigm. You can be anything you want, right? So we have our circus of the administration right now. There's, uh, the, the Secretary of Health is a, a transgender. Then we had one guy in, front, uh, in, in, in charge of our nuclear uh, waste or whatever. Did you see that guy? The Brighton guy? 
uh, wow. Now he got fired for stealing stuff, right? But it's a circus. But this is allowable. This is the new norm. And even the comic books and the Disney shows and all of this, this is the Joker. Now the Joker's pregnant. I mean, seriously, DC Comics, Marvel, the whole thing. And, and guess who they're targeted to? Kids, right? Who in their right mind thinks that a man can have a baby? That a man can menstruate? Because in California, we put, uh, we put uh, the dispensers in the boys' room for them. I mean, it's lunacy, right? And now they're going after our kids in the culture, right? So they're doing the transgender things with our kids. They're giving them hormone blockers. You know what's going on. Guys, that's demonic. That's totally demonic. And I already know how Jesus feels about this. He said it. You cause one of these little ones to sin, it would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the deepest ocean. Oh, and, I, and you try to use that, our Lord's words, which are very true, and they say, man, you are causing violence, Brandon, by saying that. You are, 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 are causing harassment to these poor people, making us the oppressor and them the victim. Really, when did it occur in the United States history where I can quote Jesus, and that's saying violence now? You see where it's going? That's demonic. And really what we're doing with our kids and what's being allowed is we're giving our kids to Moloch. We're sacrificing not only with abortion, but the whole transgender thing, the whole cutting off body parts, and you could be whatever, and they're causing multiple personality disorders among our kids, and we might as well be handing our kids over to Moloch because it's the same thing. So we know that, right? And so in this vacuum, look at this. Satan, Satan is increasing by 167% between 2011 and 2021 in England and Wales. So this is the new norm. Daily Mail also recorded that the, the rise of Satanism in America is at an all-time high. And it's particularly to the young people, the millennials and Gen Z. See, it's appealing to them because Satanism is telling them, oh, we don't worship the devil. What we really are about is freedom. Freedom to be yourself. Freedom to do what you want. Freedom to identify as what you want. You see how it plays into the whole mantra of wokeism? And so now kids are being attracted to this Satanism now because it tells them you can be and do anything you want to do. Don't be a part of that Christianity thing. That's old school. That, that's where they tell you all a bunch of rules and they tell you what to do and they restrict your life and you can't be the person you're supposed to be. And that's what's gaining ground in America. Even you go to McDonald's. McDonald's is serving up fries with the occultic bizarre tarot cards offer. Know your fate. I mean, it's everywhere, right? But that's the culture. And by the way, did you know this, this guy got busted at your mall over here? Dude, we heard that in California. I'm like, is that guy in California or is it? No, no, it's, it's in Minnesota. They told him to take his Jesus shirt off. Where's the free speech anymore? Who are we afraid to offend, right? Now, today, people think they have a right not to be offended. I don't know where that came from. Marxism, communism, I don't know, but it didn't come from the Bible. So we know that on a broad perspective. That's what's happening in the culture. But the problem is, it's happening in the church. And we call this the great apostasy. It's happening. We know it. We've talked about it. And it's going on. And as we watch this, the percentage of Americans who identify as Christian dropped 15% over the last 14 years, while those who consider themselves religiously unaffiliated increased by 14 29% of adults list their religion as none. 33% of Americans said uh, religion is too, isn't too, or is not at all important to them. While 26 say it's somewhat important to them. Somewhat important, or it's not at all. This is a problem. Christianity is shrinking in America. And we, we talk about this, Jan and I and, and Pastor Mark uh, talk about this. Look, man... We're starting to realize who's really, who's really on our side now. And it's getting smaller and smaller. Thank God I know, but I know everybody's name in the remnant now. That's how small it's becoming. Right? I mean, it's really narrowing the field. And you saw this. A third of pastors don't even have a biblical worldview, and they're behind this pulpit. 
What in the world, right? And so what we're seeing, and this came, uh, uh, Barna used this, this study and said, look, 62% embrace a hybrid worldview known as syncretism in the church. In the church, they're blending all kinds of other religious aspects with Christianity. So what do we have? We have demonic magnets going on in the church. Christian psychic readings, tarot cards continue to grow in popularity. What? Are you serious? Christian yoga, you know that's been a problem, and they, they keep doing it. Even though we have warned, Jan's had people on her program warning of Christian yoga, it doesn't matter. They keep doubling down. We're just going to do it. And now they're doing hot yoga with goats. Literally, yeah, Christian yoga with goats climbing on your back. Apparently, it's some, that's something. I don't know. It's in, I don't know what the goat does for you. Walks on your back while you're doing your, your Hindu poses. Bizarre. Then we got a bunch of churches pushing the Enneagram. Hey, man, this comes from Babylon. Do you know the origins comes from, like, the guy who came, brought it over to Europe? He said, this comes from Babylon. And what it's, it's doing is, <laughs> think about this. It's aligning your endocrine system with the planetary influences. That's straight from Babylon. That, oh, the planets have a, 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 an effect on me and my personhood. And this is the Enneagram. And this is how you find your true self. And this is how you go deeper. No, it's not. It's New Age occultic. And it's, it's, it's wrapped in Western psychology. So this is bad. But yet, church is doing it. That's attracting demonic activity. Centering prayer. Look, man, blanking out your mind. And even if you say the name of Jesus over and over again. It's going to attract you to the demonic. Because that is Hinduism. You're supposed to blank out your mind. The problem is, when you go into that world, that spiritual world will fill it. And it's not from God. And that's what this centering prayer does. Now, all the big shots push this. Centering prayer. Uh, uh, Beth Moore had a big old conference. I had ladies in my church that went to one of Beth Moore's conferences. She got everyone in the audience quiet blanked out their minds, and they went into centering prayer. And they were doing the ums. Okay, man, that's, that's off the chain. That's off the chain. Why do, why do other Christians allow this? And that was years ago, but she told me that's what they had her do. And now, what do we have in the churches? Lesbian, gay pastors? Really? Really? Look at this. These are the, the new lyrics of, of Christian songs. Because I'm a man who loves a man. And now we got drag queen pastors now. We went past lesbian and gay pastors. We're now into drag queen pastors and drag queen Bible study hours. I, I see this every week. It's growing. It's more accepted. Look at this, man. It's everywhere. Okay. When Christians do that, they are attracting the demonic at that point in time. Those are all occultic practices. You blank out your mind, you're going to attract demonism. You practice Christian yoga, you're going to attract demons. All of this is attracting demonic uh influence into the church where people are actually starting to have paranormal activity and rightfully so so here's some of the lists that are things that are going on when christians are being harassed hearing voices outwardly in one's head okay demonic paralysis or sleep paralysis harassment dreams electronics going haywire i don't know about you but every sunday morning my electronics go haywire and I'm sure it has, happens for you guys. You're like, everything worked, and now it doesn't. It happens all the time. Somehow they figured out to, to do electronics. They'll turn things on, turn things off. It's constant. Manifesting apparitions. So that you're at the third level of demonic harassment when you start seeing things. And that's what people report. They report to me that they come in their hallway and they see... Um, the top it looks like a man, and the bottom looks like a dog. It has dog legs and dog feet. And they go, Pastor, is that normal? I said, no, that's not normal. 
that's not normal to be seeing that. Well, we thought this was spiritual warfare. I said, no, 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 that's not the normal spiritual warfare. You're, you're at the oppression level. Well, I thought it was wrong because one time, we, we were, the night before, we were laying in our bed, my husband and I, and uh, I, I was pinned to the bed and I couldn't move. And I was calling out for my husband, and he ran around to the side to get me. And then they got him and picked him up and threw him across the room and continued to keep me paralyzed while they threw my husband across the room. Is that normal? No, that's not normal. That's not normal to be seeing things like that. Is it normal, Pastor, that in my closet I keep hearing voices cuss at me all the time? And laughing at me. Is that normal, pastor? No, it's not normal. Something else is going on. Is it normal, pastor, that I I hear in the other room bangs and clangs and things actually moving in my, my house? No, that's not normal. You're having paranormal activity. And more and more Christians are reporting this to me. It's happening. Something's going on. You'll start, um having homicidal or suicidal thoughts, loss of time, blackouts, extreme fear, paranoia. Some people are attacked sexually. I know that sounds weird, but they are, because they report it to me, that they had sexual encounters, both ways, male and females. It's, it's really bizarre. But look, not that I'm a fan of the Catholic Church, there's losses of ball and high weeds, but the Catholics had uh, the, the whole sector of their, their, their church uh, committed to this, even in the Middle Ages. They called it the incubus and succubus. Well, based on what I'm hearing from people, people have actually experienced this. It's still going on. It wasn't a Roman Catholic phenomenon. It's still happening. And I'll ask them, well, what happened? I was raped. You were raped, Yeah. And I, I, well, what, well, I started, you know, uh, having these manifestations. What? Yeah. Addictions that control the person can bring it. Overwhelming sense of darkness, the presence of evil, bondage, chains, oppression. Burning or sulfuric smells in the home. The funny thing is when you smell demons or fallen angels, they smell like sulfur or something that's burning. Hey, uh, a hatred or a bitterness towards other with no justifiable reason. Spiritual attacks in numerous ways, such as family, work, jobs, marriage, movements of objects, banging things, laughter being cussed out, animals being disturbed, temporary physical ailments, pain, a band around your head, a buzzing in your ears, inability to speak or hear, sudden severe headache, hypersensitivity in hearing or touch, sudden chills or over, overwhelming heat in the body, numbness in the arms or legs, and temporary paralysis. This is what's happening. And again, I'm not here to scare you. Why is this happening? Right? Why is the increase? Let's continue on. One of the reasons is not only is the culture being demonized, but the church is being demonized, but the prophetic stage is getting close to the to the, the, the tribulation period, obviously. That's what we talk about constantly, right? We're talking about this on a continual basis, on Jan's show, my podcasts, and everything. Do you not think the demons don't know that? That the fallen angels don't know that? That things are seem to be lining up? They're gearing up. And if they're controlling people like Klaus Schwab and the globalists and everyone to do their agenda, they know They've got to take as many people into the tribulation as they can. And so, again, they've got to do something. They've got to create false narratives. They've got to create lies because guess what's ready to happen? The rapture. They've got to explain this thing away. That's why you're seeing so much demonic activity and what we call UFOs or unidentified uh, aerial phenomenon, as they call them now, UAPs. Why did the government come out and say, yes, we have these on record, we see these things? Why are so many reporting this? It's high demonic activity. These are not aliens. High demonic activity to give us a narrative that when we are taken away, they will say the aliens took them. And those involved in the occult 
the avatars or the demons that were talking to them that they were channeling, we're all calling this the great evacuation. And that, and literally in Chuck's book, it says this, quoting the demons channeling. What will happen is two billion people will disappear and that's when the, the, the spaceships will take the bad people off the planet. But don't be alarmed. They're also going to take the children too and they're going to inhabit another planet and start over. So don't be afraid when the children are taken. I mean, right down to the wire, they have actually the stages of the rapture even mentioned and explained in a lie. And that's why I think we're seeing so much UFOs, UAPs, or whatever you want to call them, because they've got to have an excuse for where we're going. Um, Pentagon officials are scheduled to testify in front of House, and they did, by the way, regarding the aerial phenomenon. Do you know what was in that report? It's a 1,500-page report. Burns, um, all kinds of pain, uh, all kinds of uh, sensations that were given when these pilots were close to these things, right? The pilots would go out and try to meet them, right? They suffered all kinds of physical ailments by being close. And think about this. I know this sounds bizarre, but the Pentagon, in their papers, described some of the females getting pregnant, and then all of a sudden they weren't. What is that? What is that? I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. But these people in our U.S. military who are having these encounters were suffering from the same thing you see in satanic ritual abuse. And the funny thing is, MIT did a study on satanic ritual abuse and alien ab abductions. And you know what MIT concluded? They're virtually the same. Wow. Okay. And this is, comes to us. It's to silence you. And what I have noticed in these last few years is that people who are out there giving it their all for the Lord. They're, they're, they're sacrificing. They're making an influence. They're, they're reaching people with the truth and the gospel. Now they're starting to get harassed. And they, had not, they have not been involved in the occult. They have, they're, they're, they're as far away from the occult as possible. And yet it's happening to them. It happens to my own staff. It happens to people I know that are solid. And the only thing I can come up with is why is because they want to silence us. They want us to shut down, not say anything. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, uh, vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, what does that passage mean? You know that the devil's out there, but he's, what is this idea of seeking whom he may devour? The best explanation I've seen for this is he's trying to take away our influence to shut us down, to shelve us. He would rather you just pack it all in, put the white sheets on, and wait for Jesus to return, rather than you going out there and telling the truth to people. He wants you to quit. He wants you to surrender. He wants you to give in. That's the whole game. To devour you is to shelve you, to take away your influence. And you can't let him. Because he's going to try to intimidate you, right? So my thing is, how do you fight this? Well, first of all, you've got to understand the reality of this. Let's talk about it. There are four levels of demonic harassment. The first level is influence. Now, we're all at that level. We can all be influenced. Peter was influenced, right? We can all have that. It's to compel, to tempt, to persuade, affect our thinking, to drive the person towards sinful attitudes or getting outside of the will. That can happen to anybody, okay? That is normal, first level spiritual warfare, okay? That's first level. But if it goes into suppression, that's another level. What is suppression? Well, the person, the Christian, has got himself involved in sin. A protracted period of unconfessed, unrepentant sin. And what the demon will do then is suppress you in that sin. 
And what many believers will, will relate to us is they, lack, they feel that they lack the power to get out of it. And that's why you have to have intervening help in the intermediaries to help that person, to pray for them, and to help them get out of it because they're now trapped in it. And again, open sin, practicing occultism like we saw with enagrams and Christian yoga, that opens the person up, right, to suppression. The next level is oppression, okay, oppression. What does this include? The demons will harass and torment the person via various means. Dreams. And these dreams are off the chart. It's not a dream. When you have one of these harassment dreams, they are off the chart. They will mock you. They will strip you naked. They will cuss at you, chase you down. And, 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 and there's always a sexual component in it. And you wake up, and it's not a dream. It's real. It's like you've been there. It's so different. And they'll harass you through this. What else? Apparitions. Yeah, manifest. they will manifest to scare you, to intimidate you. What do they, what do they manifest as? It's up to them. They'll do it. In a, some, some people report that there's blacked, blackened animals in their room. Most people report to us that there's these ghostly figures that are draped in black and they just sit there in front of their bed and just stay there. Some report seeing old men uh, in, in, in being draped in black and different things like that. Those kinds of things are real. It's happening. And that's what gets reported to me. Voices, obviously. Noises, laughing, moving objects, harassment dreams, being cussed out sexually seduced in the dream actually so what will happen in the dream is that like uh people will report to me a gorgeous woman will appear to them in the dream and try to seduce them in the dream and then when they get close to the woman it turns into a demonic creature and then they go on the attack and harass the person in the dream the person will wake up screaming from the dream typically that's how harassing it is it's, it, I know, it, 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 that's why you need to pray before you go to bed. You don't want that. So it, 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 what I'm trying to tell you is you have to be on guard. You need to be praying. You need to be, uh, you know, devoting your life to the Lord because that's your only protection to this. And you have to find the, that, that safety in Jesus. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more. One of the things that certain people have, they start having depression because of this, because it won't go away. They go to their pastor, and the pastor says, that's not happening. I can't tell you how many people tell me their pastors won't take them seriously. They'll just say, I'm cra you're crazy, and that's not happening, and you're out of your mind. It's not. We get too many reports of this happening. They go into certain parts of their house, and it feels dark. Or their kids will report to them a playmate. I was at Billy Crone's church. I'll tell you this story. Uh, about two years ago, and uh, went there, talked to a lady that was having harassment to her child. And these are people that go to Billy's church. They're solid, right? But this, this child, she said, has a playmate. But Brandon, it's more than a playmate. This thing is a spiritual entity. And this child is acting like it's a playmate, and the demon's pretending to be a playmate. So the child's inviting them to have, to have dinner. Where, and I can't remember the, the kid's, uh, what he named it. But anyway, aren't you, mom, aren't you going to invite so-and-so to dinner? I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, he's right there in the corner. He wants to come join us. It was a demonic entity. So I, I first said, you had anybody in your house messing with the occult? She goes, well, you know what? My fiancé, he's into Ouija boards and stuff like that. I said, bingo, you got it. I said, you either need to get rid of him or he needs to renounce it. Otherwise, they're going to keep attacking your child. I saw her the next year at Billy's, this year, and she came up to me and says, Pastor, you won't believe what happened. She goes, I confronted my fiancé about that. My fiancé realized what I was saying. Realized what was happening to the kid, and he actually got saved. Yeah, amen, right? Amen. He got saved, and it's all went away. 
But, but you see, the affiliation of that girl with this guy is what brought the demon in and allowed the demon to harass the child. And you see all kinds of weird stuff like that. And that's why it's extremely important of who you associate with. If they're part of the, the occultic world or dabbling in the occultic world, have nothing to do with them because somehow, some way, they can start affecting your family. You really have to pay attention to this because a lot of times people have to cut their own family members off. Anyway, the fourth level. A believer doesn't have to worry about this level. It's the level of possession. Okay, Believers cannot be possessed. But the believers can have first three Influence, suppression, and oppression. And as you saw with oppression, you can see paranormal activity happening around you, even though you're not possessed. It's happening to children, happening to people in the home, and things of that nature. So what do I do, Brandon? Well, the first thing is you have to face the reality of this. You know, C.S. Lewis made the point that, look, if you don't take this seriously, if you don't take Satan seriously, um you're going to make a big mistake. You've got to know your enemies out there and what they're doing. And currently now, this is where the attack is. So you've got to face the reality. And that's what the, the Ephesians 6 is about. Why does Paul tell us to put on the full armor of God? Because he's telling you you're going to be attacked. That's right. It is a war. No, I've talked to Laodicean believers, and I'm talking to them. And they say, Brandon, tell me this. In your, in your counseling, what is... Um, what is the most things you talk about in counseling? I said, well, marriage is number one, but number two is this, demonic harassment. And they're like, what? And they go, I thought that happened only in Jesus' day. What? No, 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 no. It's happening now. And they're shocked that I say that. They think I'm crazy. But that's Laodicea, right? They think I'm crazy. Because here's the thing. Why is Laodicea being left alone? Because they're not doing anything. They're not making an influence. They're sitting about having their worldly life, and they're not engaged in this fight and this battle that you and I are in. He's coming after the, the warriors that are in the fight. He's got to silence you. And if he can't silence you, and if he can't get you to sin, then I'll go after your family. And a lot of us are, doing, are having to deal with this. My family is attacked because of what I'm doing. Constant. And at a level I couldn't believe is happening. So I'm telling you, the devil doesn't play fair. He will go after your family. If he can't get you, he'll go after them. Because he knows he can't silence me. He can't silence Jan. He can't silence Pastor. So guess what? Then I'll attack you in the rear and go after the weakest vessel in your home. Did it be your spouse? Did it be your kid? He doesn't play fair. And I'm just telling you, I'm having to deal with this my own self. So how do you do? Resist the devil and he will flee. What does that mean? It means stand your ground with the word of God. And here's what you have to understand. You must know the word of God backwards and forwards. Because if you don't, he will throttle you. Because the devil knows the Bible better than most Christians. And that's where he gets them. So... The, the, the other big thing you must understand is your identity will be challenged. Now, what do you mean by that? Most people don't even know what this is. Your identity in Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, I can tell you this. There's like 75 different scriptures that discuss who you are in Christ and what is available to you and what authority that you have and how you can operate. If you do not know all those different levels of identity of who you are in Christ, he will take advantage of the areas you don't know. And he will challenge you on your identity. I get it all the time. Who do you think you are? Right? And you better know the answer to that when you're challenged about your identity. Right? You better know your identity. Look what that father did in that story I gave you. Of what he kept saying to the, the demon. He kept going back to the identity, didn't he? He's a child of God. You have nothing over him. He kept going back to the identity. It's crucial you know who you are in Christ. If you don't, that's where you're going to be attacked. Okay, confess your sins. Now, we all know this. We're all going to mess up every day. 
unconfessed sins give the devil not only the ability to accuse you before the Father, but then to work in an area and establish a beachhead in you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Paul will use the word beachhead or foothold, but it's like a military that gets established on Normandy and you establish a beachhead and then you attack the person from that beachhead. If the believer goes with unconfessed, unrepentant sin, he will get that foothold in that person. If they don't know their identity, he will get that foothold in their identity and attack. And that person won't even know they're being attacked. By the time they realize it, it's too late. He's already driven them to make a decision that will be poor. So understanding that dealing with your own personal sin, just keep confessing. Keep repenting. It's an ongoing process and stay in fellowship with the Lord. Okay? Renounce your sins in the occult. If you were involved in the occult, you need to renounce them. And you need to do it publicly. Because this is what I've, I've learned. I've seen Christians get saved and they still are being harassed. And you know why? Because the demon says they still have a, a, a freedom to move in the person because they haven't closed the door to what they did. So whether they're involved in Ouija boards, whether they're involved in necromancy, whether they're involved in whatever occultic practice, that has to be renounced. You must formally renounce it in the name of Jesus Christ. I renounce that. I will never do that again, Father. See, it's, most believers think that, well, I, I stopped doing it. In the demonic world, they don't care if you stop doing it. They want to know if they still have the freedom and the license to keep haranguing you in that area. And if you have allowed that open door because you haven't renounced it and what you did, they will still use it. So what we get people to do is renounce it and then it finally goes away. And, th and then here's what they find out. That just one renouncement, sometimes it happens, but sometimes it doesn't. And they say, Brandon, how long am I supposed to renounce it? Until they go away. You just keep renouncing it until they go away. And eventually they'll leave you. So you, you can't give in. You just can't think it's one time. How about this? Please have extended periods of prayer and fasting. Because that's your pipeline to the Father. Right? You, 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 you can talk to the Father. You can go beyond the veil. They do not like you praying. I can guarantee you that. So prayerlessness will get you jammed up. I can tell you the power of prayer. I was in front of a woman that had been with Anton LaVey in San Francisco since she was 13. Blood baptized in, in Satanism and went around the world with Anton LaVey doing so-called miracles. When we were dealing with her, she had, had, had confessed to me that she had allowed 12 demons to enter her. So we were dealing with 12 of them inside of her. And I can tell you this. Every time I went to prayer, they went crazy. Because they knew I had an instant pipeline to the Father through the Messiah. And that I could talk to the Father directly. And I had never seen these creatures go ballistic, but they did. And you know what? When they took over the woman, and when they looked into my eyes, I saw blackness, and like I was looking into a tunnel of a thousand yards of blackness, and they, they took over the countenance of her face, and this is what the countenance said. If I could get you, I would kill you right now. That's what they want to do. But I'm protected because I'm under the Messiah, right? I have, I'm under his authority. They can't touch me. But boy, they hated me and they didn't like me praying. Do not let that go by. You must get into periods of fasting and praying to offset this. Destroy every occultic object in your home or paganism. Now people, they're like, I don't have anything in my house. Wait a second. If you're having harassment, maybe you do. For instance, I've had people say, oh, I'm being harassed and I don't understand. Well, they'll have a family heirloom get passed down to them from a family member. And sometimes it's Indian 
family heirloom, but you look at it and it's like, oh my goodness, that's an amulet. You know, American Indians were involved in animism, right? Paganism. And so how these things pass down, then that's happening. They get rid of it and it stops. Some people go on vacation to Africa or India or some of these third world countries. They bring back items and they give them as gifts to people. Guess what? It's an idol and they don't even know it and it brings the demons with them. And I said, you got to burn that, crush that, get that out of your house. And you know what? It stops. I've had many, many people tell me they didn't know that the things in their home were part of the occult because their family members had passed it down. You must purge your house of that. <clears throat> Next, sever contact with phys- a, a psychics, necromancers, mediums, or anyone involved in the occult, including family. Now, I'm sure you're not hanging around with the, the carnival psychic. I know that's not happening to you. But what I'm saying is you will have family members that might be involved in this. And here's the thing. I've had people tell me, Brandon, we had so-and-so over for dinner. This is our sister, uh, sister and, her, and, and my brother-in-law. They came over for dinner. We were having dinner, and we found out that, you know, he's involved in psychics or whatever. And we were shocked, and then they left the house. But guess who they left behind? The demons. And the demons started harassing them. And they go, Brandon, what's that? I said, look, man, I don't know all of what's happening here. But I do know a pattern, and that's all I'm going to say. The pattern sometimes is you're rubbing elbows with somebody involved in the occult. Those demons will end up rubbing off on you and and start harassing you. And I said, man, you need to rebuke that. You need to renounce that. And I I would say, look, if they're not going to stop in being involved in the occult, you need to cut that relationship off until they do. And they did, and it went away. But as long as they kept that relationship going, they had demonic harassment. It's a big deal, man, with associations. I'm telling you. Do not isolate fellowship with other believers. Now, I know I've talked to some of you out here that are isolated. And you have nowhere to go because the churches are woke and crazy. But it's going to be important that you find a smaller group that you can fellowship with. Because what the demons are wanting to do is isolate you. They want to get you by yourself so they can work on you and do the mind trip they do, they do when you're by yourself. Why do you think everyone went crazy in the COVID lockdowns? Right? They lost their minds, many people, because they were isolated. What do you do to prisoners that you can't control in prison? You put them what? In isolation, don't you? It works, and they know it works. Always be, try as your best, be with the body of Christ and don't isolate. Expunge every false doctrine from you and replace it with true doctrine. Okay? This is where you have to be unspotted and being clean theologically. Renew your mind in order to identify the demonic lies. So if you don't know how Satan's going to come at you, and he does come at you, it's because you haven't renewed your mind enough. Your mind has to be renewed so that you can see the wiles of the devil, that you can see the roar of the lion before he even gets to you. But those who do not re- uh, renew their mind will be caught. They won't even hear the roar. And before they know it, he's on them and eaten them. And know what lies your lies are so that you know uh, the word of God, the truth about those lies, and that will set you free. Well, what do you mean? You're going to have to do some deep introspection, guys. Very deep introspection when you get involved in spiritual warfare. Here's the thing. The demons, sometimes they're called in the Old Testament familiar spirits. Why are they called familiar spirits? Because they're familiar with you. They're familiar with me. They've been watching us. That's why some angels are called watcher angels, Daniel chapter 4. What do watcher's angels do? They watch. And they sit there and they observe. They see what happens behind the scenes. They see what happens in the back corner. They see what you say behind closed doors. They see what you do behind closed doors. And that's how they make their plan to attack you. They see everything. They're called watcher angels. They're fallen, but they're watchers. And they're familiar because they're familiar with you. This is why some people are fooled. They'll have grandma appear to them. And it's the same smell as grandma. It's the same voice as grandma. And then grandma will tell them from the grave, oh, the locket I wanted you to have, it's in the third drawer. And I wanted Mary to have that. And I didn't get to tell you guys before I died. 
And guess what? That lock will be in the third drawer. And it will smell like grandma. And it will look like grandma. But you know what that is? That's a familiar spirit. Ghosts are familiar spirits impersonating dead loved ones. Okay? And that's what they'll do. And, and this kind of stuff, you know, is prevalent. So, again, let me go back to the, the lie issues. The key in sanctification as you grow in the Lord is to know what lies you have believed in because that's where the beachhead will be formed. And if you, if you don't discover where those lies are, he will take advantage of you not knowing the truth in that area. Okay? And it's, it's, this, this is how the game is played. What you don't know will be what he takes advantage of. And, and so you have to do deep, deep introspection in your sanctification. Why do I act the way I do? Okay, you have to ask yourself that. And your proclivities and my proclivities, I've got to evaluate what am I doing. Because if I don't, that's where he gets us. And at the end of the day, guys, when you do all of this and you use the tools that God gives you, and you know your authority. You know your position in Christ. You do not have to be afraid. Because look what the promise is. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? I need you in the fight. Jan needs you in the fight. Pastor Mark needs you in the fight. I don't want to see anybody left on the battlefield that's not in the fight. It is a time to rise up, not be afraid, and fight with us. Because this is a spiritual battle. And we're losing people because it's getting too rough for them. They're seeing the demonic attacks and they can't handle it. And they're, they're, they're going AWOL on us, man. We need you in the battle. Please, recognize this. And let's fight together against the forces of darkness through Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, um, for the times we live in. We understand the battle that we're in. But help us, Father, to do and use the tools you have provided through your son, Jesus Christ. We do not have to be afraid. We need to resist the devil and to make sure we get the truth out about not only your son, but what's getting ready to happen, Father. Help us to have courage, put steel in our soul, Father, to do the work you've called us to do. We pray now in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you. Pastor Brandon, thank you for ministering to us tonight. Hey, let's give him a hand one more time. I just want to say thank you to all of you who have joined the team, the prayer team, the financial team, the giving team. Listen, God is giving you spiritual fruit all around the world. Jan and I see it every single week from emails and people calling in. Uh, you are touching people in a powerful way. You're strengthening the hand of God's people. You're sharing the gospel with uh, people in these last days who are looking for answers to all the complexities and all the confusion around them. Thank you for loving the Lord with all of your heart. Well, hey, at this time, we're going to have our offering. Uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and come in-house before we pray. If you're watching online, you can give on the app. You can give at the web page. Uh, know that it's safe, secure, and simple. And I just want to say thank you to all of you again who have given so much sacrificially to make all this possible. We love you for it. Father, I'm thankful for those who have joined uh, the team and advanced the gospel both here and around the world. God, I pray that you would continue to open to us a wide door of ministry that no one can shut until Jesus comes. We pray it in his name, amen. Well, hey, just a couple of quick things uh, as we look down the road. In November, we're gonna be having another Israel trip. Jera and I would love to have you join us. Uh, check out the information that's on the webpage. Also, Jan and I have been greatly burdened about helping pastors in their church speak on the subject of eschatology. In fact. In my 33 years of pastoring, never have I had so many pastors contact me and say, help me figure out how to preach messages in the book of Revelation and Daniel. And so we wanna create something new. It's gonna be called the Pastor's Huddle. Uh, it'll follow the events that we're having, the understanding the time events. And what we'd like to do is have 25 pastors come at a time. We'll be talking about hermeneutics, dispensations, the book of Daniel, book of Revelation. 
and helping uh, equip our pastors to go back and share the gospel through the prophetic books of the Bible and strengthen the hand of God's people. So you be praying, you be watching, you pastors especially, be watching my webpage for all of that. Well, hey, at this time, I want you to remember Pastor Tom. He's gonna be with us March 16th. Let's watch this together. This is lawlessness. So in the last days, this is very interesting how Lindsay recently pointed it out that the Bible shows a picture, gives us a picture of the last days with lawlessness abounding. But at the same time, we have this, this uh, very strong rule that comes from Antichrist with iron teeth as has Daniel described it. So how do you have this super strong rule with at the same time, you when at the same time you have lawlessness? It's like this. The lawlessness, I believe, is being purposely created. Bring in the chaos, and then the people cry out, we need something to save us, give us anybody you can, and the right police to be able to control all of the chaos and all of the lawlessness that there is. Jesus says this is how it's going to be in the last days, and we see how all of it is developing. Hey, at this time, let's welcome our panel. Brandon, thank you so much, man. That was awesome, brother. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And such a timely message for these days, as we know, as you read through the book of Revelation, that the last days, as God removes his hand of blessing and protection from nations, that not only lawlessness increases, but the spirit of lawlessness working behind that, the demonic influence is going to increase. That's yeah. exactly what you described. That's exactly yeah, what we're seeing. Exactly. Uh, Jan, you've got some items for us you want to share with us. Yeah, I do. As a matter of fact, uh, just a couple of two or three announcements here. By the way, online, uh, Brandon has, uh, you have a 50 par 5 part series on spiritual warfare. Is that right? Yeah, I do. 50 lessons, teachings on how to battle. It, some of you may feel somewhat overwhelmed from what you've just heard. Easy to do. But we're in the last days. In the last days, evil will wax worse and worse. Second Timothy 3. What did you think the last days would look like? Yeah. We're in them. So it's, we're in a battle. So that's why I recommend this 50-part series. There are some things on the book table. We want to make this real, real quick. And uh, we have some DVDs of past events here. Uh, they're $10. If last our last meeting, well, we've had Michelle Bachman, we had Billy Crone, we've got a number, we had Mark Hitchcock, we had uh, Jeff Kinley, they're all back there. And uh, some products that we have back there um, on air last weekend and this weekend, Amir Sarfati and Barry Stagner, because they have an outstanding new book, Bible Prophecy, The Essentials, Answers to Your Most Common Questions, about 70, 80 questions in here. And please uh, check it out on the back table book by Jeff Kinley, as it was in the days of Noah, warnings from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm. I'm not sure that's a coming storm. I think we're in it. And then uh, we have Pastor Mark's book back there, The Man Code, 12 Essentials Every Man Needs to Know. And uh, again, a DVD of past events, this one, uh, Billy Crone. And then my, my magazine came out this week, and the only reason I'm, I'm holding it up it's because we're talking in here about what we're going to kind of talk about here. And so you can get a, a broader perspective. You know digital currency is coming probably in 2023. It's going to change the way we do business. It's going to change the way we live. With all sorts of things, <laughs> partly because of what's being talked about as we speak in Davos. They're planning a new world order, and that's putting it mildly. And so if you'd like to take one, do so. Sign up for one if you'd like to get it four times a year. Take a couple if you want back there. And um, then Brandon has a, a I want to advertise it, a church tracker, a rockharborchurch.net. You talk about it, please. Sure. Um, we have a device, an app on our website that if you're in the middle of nowhere, you can't find a good church, then you can go on our church tracker of the United States, and we're broadening out to, to other parts of the world, and find a remnant church. And what we've been able to do is identify about 1,400 remnant churches throughout the nation. Uh, you might have to drive a little ways, but um, we went through the vetting system with a lot of them, and uh, we now can 
can uh, endorse, uh, hey, try this church out. So uh, go to our church tracker, rockharborchurch.net, and find a church in your area maybe. Okay, and then this whole program will be available online. It might have to be edited for a day or two. Olivetreeviews.org and go to video, markhenryministries.com. Be on our YouTube channel, hopefully. Uh, Rumble channel, that, no problems there. So give it a day or two and it'll be up. And if, if you can't catch it all or you want to refer people to it, It'll all be available online, hopefully until the rapture and then beyond as well, so the, the lost can see things like this. Mark, it's all yours. Well, we got a number of uh, videos I just want you two to respond to and kind of help us think through, and they cover a number of topics. We're going to continue kind of just talking about this demonic influence and oppression, and we're going to show a video here. Um, I think there's a lot of little uh, nuances that would, might be helpful to you. But just know this, the, the video kind of presents it or suggests that this person was saved and they're demonically uh, possessed. And as Brandon's already shared, uh, that's impossible. Uh, we recognize that, he, that Satan can sift a believer, he can oppress a believer, but he can't indwell a believer. In fact, there's many people who believe that they're saved. How many of you know there's many people who believe that they're saved and they're not? In fact, Jesus says a whole bunch of them in the last days will say, Lord, you know, of course you know us. We did this for you and we did this. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. So let this be a call to you just because you've gone to church, just because you've raised your hand somewhere. The question is, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? It matters in the spiritual battle. Let's watch this together. She was someone who I trusted, someone who I became comfortable being around. She spoke to me and she said, Alicia, I want to tell you something. And she said, I'm involved in the occult. Alicia Sweeting Miller was 13 years old when she met Lorona, a school teacher who told Alicia she had psychic powers. And she said that, I've seen the gift in you. I've seen the gift in you, and that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to you. I was attracted to you, and so I believe that I could help advance this gift. At the time, Alicia was living in Jamaica, where her parents raised her in church. In fact, just months before, she had given her life to Christ. It was really genuine. I was really excited because I knew for fact that if I had died that time I was in the right place or right standing and I just begin to spread the good news that I have I was now a Christian I was now serving God at first Alicia was wary of Lorona but there was also something intriguing about her new friend I began to think that okay if she was a witch or if she practiced this thing maybe she was a good person maybe she was a good witch I begin to think about all the shows that I was seen on television I begin to more deny be in denial as to what she really was little by little she introduced Alicia into the occult using tarot cards meeting spirit guides and summoning spirits there was one evening I decided I was gonna summon the demon suddenly I felt a jerk and the only thing I remembered after that was walking down the streets in the traffic. A couple of neighbors were there. They were saying all sorts of stuff like maybe it was drugs and she was on drugs and this thing was driving her out of her mind. As she delved more into the occult, Alicia enjoyed the sense of control she felt it gave her. I wanted to have that recognition. I wanted to be known about becoming one of the world's powerful witch. And I wanted to do what I wanted to do and no one telling me what to do. Alicia moved to the Bahamas to delve deeper into occult practices. She also became an angry and vengeful woman, ready to cast a spell on anyone who crossed her. At the time, I always believed that no one would do me anything and get away with it. I would have to get you back, and it would have to be worse than what you did to me. You know, I had this vengeance in me, and I felt as if though I had to be my own god. By her early 20s, Alicia was a well-known witch, making great money reading fortunes for conventioneers. Then, one evening, Alicia had a visitor. I was coming from Paradise Island. At that night, I did one of the biggest reading of my entire life. I think I read for almost 1,500 persons. And as I was driving over the bridge, it felt as if there was someone else was in the car with me. And I began to look over my shoulders, look in the mirror to make sure that no one else was in the car. And I began to think to myself, wonder if I picked up a spirit that was over there. That night when I got home, I felt as if though I was dumb. I felt like I couldn't talk. And I laid in the bed that night and I could not sleep. But I felt like I could not get up out of the bed to open the door and I could not open my mouth to say, hey, I'm in here. Alicia began to feel pressure on her chest that felt like a heart attack. I began to think to myself, I'm gonna die. Only in the movies, when I watch the movies that someone is gonna die, that their entire life begin to flash across their face just like this. 
And so I began to say, if I die, I don't want to die like this. For the first time since she was 13, Alicia prayed to God. And I said, you know, God, if you spare me, if you give me one more chance, I would serve you. I want to change my life. I want to turn things around. I, I promise you that I would serve you for the rest of my life and I will tell others about you and about what you did for me. The presence left. Afterwards, Alicia called Lorona to tell her she was through and started reading her Bible and praying daily. Wow, there's a lady that in, was influenced by a teacher and was introduced to the whole occult. Friends, you don't want to make friends with witches. There's no such thing yeah. as a good witch. Right. Am I right? I mean, That's right. That's the whole point. Uh, your associations matter. Yeah. You know, bad company corrupts good characters, Paul said. But it, when you're dealing with people in the occult, it's a whole new ball game because the demonic will come after you uh, as well. So just very, be very, very careful, guys. Jan, how you... Uh, had some involvement with the cult when you're in your younger years. How were you introduced to that? How were you seduced? <laughs> uh, well, quite frankly, at my Christian college, I'll leave it unnamed. Most people know of the college I would name. And obviously that's a few years ago, but nonetheless, back then it was treated, the Ouija board was treated as a kind of a, a novelty, kind of a game. And this, so, uh, so, so hold it. Now you've, yeah. you've gone to a, to a church here locally, you yes. trusted Christ as your Savior, Absolutely. I'm assuming. And now you're at a Bible college, Bible and you're college. introduced to the occult That's at right. a Bible college? Yes, right. And again, a lot of this is treated as a novelty. It's fun. It's, it's just intriguing. And that's the way it was perceived at this particular Christian college. And, and, and the kids were just totally in... in enmeshed in, in the Ouija board, yes. And, and therefore, I was thrown off guard because I thought it must be harmless because all these wonderful Christian kids are talking to it. And I went on and got very deeply involved. And we, we don't need to go into detail. The only point is the devil is so sneaky, he's so cunning that he even seduced uh, a whole, hundreds and hundreds of students at this Christian college, I'm leaving a name, uh, though you'd all know of it, um, could that happen today? Not only could it happen today, it'd be even worse today because this is an occultized society and it's creeping into the church, as Brandon so adequately expressed, from the walking the labyrinth to contemplative prayer to the Enneagram to Christian yoga. There's no such thing as Christian yoga, okay? It's an oxymoron. It does not exist. And I know some of you who are watching are engaged in it, and you think it's harmless. I'm sorry, but you are, you are uh, da dancing with the devil. Yeah. Well, that's actually our next talking point there, yeah. is the <laughs> yoga church. Yoga church. Yeah. And friends, this is everywhere. I mean, yeah. it, 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 yeah. go Google it. You'll be shocked. Now, now, Brandon, you're a pastor. People say this all the time. But I don't do it to be involved with the occult. It's just exercise. You know why I tell them? There's all sorts of other ways to exercise. Why are you right. using Hindu uh, poses and so forth to open right. your soul up to the, I, What do you say? To yeah, them? it's the same thing. It, the, the practice of yoga can't be separated from its religious aspect. I don't care if you're saying you're stretching. Well, go stretch another way. Uh, I mean, good night. <laughs> but to... Every position in yoga is worshiping a deity of Hinduism, and you can't escape from that. And that's a practice why it's, it's forbidden. You can't do that. What about the Enneagram, you two? I mean, oh boy. Church well, staffs are being exposed to it all the time. We've done some radio on it. I mean, it's supposedly, uh, it's supposedly a personality test, and it's got, I think, nine parts to it. I've not been engaged in the Enne Enneagram, but. Um, Mark, you did a radio segment on it. I think you should talk about it. Yeah, just recently in December, we did a whole uh, hour on this very subject. I want to encourage you to go back. You can find it on um, uh, olivetreeviews.org. Uh, and, and actually, you two just did that, was a week ago, this whole series on demonic influence. And so all of this is interconnected here. Right. You don't want to dance with the devil. This isn't a game. Uh, now, Brandon, you just did a series on the Circus Church. I sure did. And, <laughs> yes, I did. And I saw the title, and I thought, wow. Now, this is really important, friends. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. And I want you to understand, we are not accusing 
the body of Christ. But there is a pseudo, a false body of Christ. Why? Satan always has to have a counterfeit. And so they may claim to be the church. They may claim to be followers of God. But just know, uh, Jesus has warned us, right? There's going to be false teachers that come in and so forth. So Brandon, you did an amazing job. I want to show a, a short clip on this. And I want you to respond. Now, when Jan and I were kind of prepping for this, she was like, this can't be coming to churches. It is coming to churches. And it's coming to a church near you and maybe the church you're at currently. Listen to this. Is why aren't we not raising cannabis? I'll be able to bring in black males. They're able to do it legally. Mm. I'm teaching them farming. Oh my God. I'm helping them to enhance the ecosystem. Uh, th th this is the kind of conversation. So if the guy, black boy in Bankhead said, they growing weed at the church? Where do I join? Yes. I don't need no pamphlet for him. Mm. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> right. He coming in. He coming in. And that, that's the group that I'm going after. Mm. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. You're different. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah, you're different. But think about it. The next church growth movement right there, there you go. is let's grow pot on church property. Now, you can laugh at that, but this pastor is very influential. Yeah. And he's speaking to a generation. And if you listened to the whole presentation, it's very convincing, Brandon. Yeah. Man, grow pot. Let's have the, the youth group smoke pot. We'll get lots of kids there. That's is right. Is this the next yeah. uh, growth spurt for the yes. American church? Yes, yeah, seeker sensitive. Yeah, it, it's, it's what the seeker sensitive, this is the end result of the seeker sensitive yeah, movement. end result. You know, where we appease what they're doing and to hopefully bring them in. Well, now you're going to have to go into, uh, you know, growing pot and endorsing, uh, you know, doing drugs now to attract people. This is where it takes you, the seeker friendly movement. Instead of confronting uh, uh, lovingly with the truth, now we're going to say, we endorse your pagan practices, come on in. We'll, we'll allow you to come in. And it's part of the whole ecumenical movement, the pluralism that we're seeing. And um, you look at that, and that's why I called it the circus church, because you're like, you're sitting there, and I know what you're thinking. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. It's also crazy to have a drag queen guy pretend to be a pastor and read Bible stories and teach the book of Noah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's like, what are you talking about? Is this a joke, Brandon? No, it's not. It's real, and it's attracting people. And these people would be out of work if no one went. So it's real. And uh, I think it's the counterfeit church that's going to go actually into the tribulation under the wh uh, whore of Babylon. That's really what it is. It's the, the, the false church. Yeah. And you could say, you know, you're, you're, you're cherry-picking something that's, like, really crazy that's not going to happen. Well... Living here in, in Minneapolis, how many churches over the last three years have abandoned the Bible, have abandoned Jesus, have abandoned biblical morality, and embraced something else? This is the trajectory mm -hmm. that's coming. No wonder Circus Church was the right title, yeah. man. Yeah. Right, right title. Yeah. Well, real quick, Davos. Uh, this week has been Davos, and uh, last night I stayed up watching uh, them talking about peace and safety being restored. Uh, we've on and on it, it goes, uh, but let's just see this quick overview really quick. The global elite are gathering at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. It's the annual meeting's first winter event in three years, and the ski town attracts CEOs, billionaires, and celebrities for a week of discussions on income inequality, climate change, and so much more. Now this year's theme, cooperation in a fragmented world. But the event does often draw criticism for attracting the ultra rich who pontificate about global issues without really committing to fixing them. Your inaction is fueling the flames by the hour. Show me the money. Talk is cheap. It turns out that nobody is as generous with their actual dollars as they are uh, with their pledges and their press release. We can talk for a very long time about all these stupid philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's, we got to be talking about taxes. Yes. That's it. Taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is in, in my opinion. 
One area where we might see some movement is on the breakdown of panels. During the last World Economic Forum, a third of the panels were devoted specifically to ESG. And the use of words like environmentalism in those Davos press releases has actually tripled since 2014. Sometimes who's not there is more interesting than who is. Former President Donald Trump is not attending, nor is current President Joe Biden. An embattled crypto entrepreneur SBF is obviously out, but there will be plenty of panels on the future of digital currency. So follow Quick Take on all social platforms to get our updates on the World Economic Forum on the ground in Davos. So Jan, what are the top three, five things you see coming out of Davos this year? What these people are planning as we speak in Davos this whole week, it's so stunning, it's almost unthinkable. They are planning to implement, they don't know it, Revelation 13. One world government, uh, probably a one world money system. It'll be um, central bank digital currency where every, year, every purchase will be tracked. Everything you buy a, a pack of gum, they'll, the government will know. This is being planned at Davos. You uh, re re briefly referenced the, one of the themes, I believe it was either yesterday or today, is peace and security or peace and safety. Right out of 1 Thessalonians 5, a sudden destruction will come. They'll say peace and safety and sudden destruction shall come. Um, they're, they're discussing how they can best control us. They're going to try to... Con coming next are climate lockdowns. I want Brandon to address it, but that's what's coming next, climate lockdowns. Um, artificial intelligence they're talking about. They're talking about transhumanism. They're listening to men like uh, Noah, or Yuval Noah Harari, an Israeli, a terribly godless man who the world is paying attention to. So these are just some things I think... Uh, um, Again, control is the key word. That, that's, that's what they're planning on controlling society as we know it through all sorts of gimmicks and schemes. But in 15 minute cities, you take over. Yeah. One of the agenda items is the 15 minute city. You can find that on their website. And what they want to establish is that. Instead of you driving all over the place, driving to work, driving to school, or, or wherever you're going to drive, they want you confined to a 15-minute area from the place where you live. And, and that radius of 15 minutes is your boundary as, as far as you can go. And they, they want you to work, stay, play, all in this 15-minute city that they're creating. And uh, again, this is for more control. It's for saving the planet, so it's really climate lockdowns. And you say, well, when are they going to implement it? Well, they're already implementing, already uh, testing it in Europe now. So I spoke to one of my friends in Europe that's in uh, Oxford, Oxfordshire, and they basically created a 15-minute city there, proposed it to the people, and here's the shocker. The people actually wanted it, that's what he told me. It wasn't even forced on them, they wanted it. So here's what the, the, the stipulations are. He can leave his home a hundred times a year, okay, to go outside of this, this barrier. If you go outside more than a hundred, he gets fined a hundred pounds or equivalently a hundred bucks, and you're fined. So basically that ends up being you can leave this 15-minute this city twice a week, and that's it. And, and you, that's your whole allotment. But what is this for? It's for control. So the climate lockdowns are the next in the stages of lockdowns. They learned so much from the uh, Charlie Oscar Victor Igloo Delta one niner lockdowns that now they're going to implement it with it. we're going to save the planet. Uh, they're, they're serious, guys. This is not conspiracy theory. It's on their website. And they're trying it right now. So... More, there, more craziness. 130 nations represented, 52 heads of nations, 52. Um, it's this entire week they're meeting. Um, all sorts of corporate CEOs, dozens and dozens of them. Of course, all flying in on private jets. Of course, all having the finest food. They want us to eat bugs. They're serious. They do. They want us to eat bugs. That is no joke. Mm -hmm. And these people that want to put all this in place, so that way, 
you can save the planet because your carbon footprint is just yeah. too much for the world to survive. No, they can pay the hundred bucks and break it as much as they want. I mean, you and I would be limited by our, uh, by our finances, right? But do you think Bill Gates can go get a hundred dollar fine every day and not have a problem? Do you think he could probably afford that? So you got to understand that's really significant. Another one of the elements that the very first day they were emphasizing is living at harmony uh, with the environment. And boy, that sounds really great. And there was a young lady that asked this question. She said, isn't it impossible to live in harmony with the environment? I mean, isn't the environment trying to kill us? <laughs> and they totally shut her out. And I'm sure it's been edited out because the reality is, Let's take away all of the wonderful technologies you have, including your sleeping bag, including the, the natural gas that we have heating my house right now, and let's, let's just go out here and let's just see what it's like to live out here in the little woodlot behind the church. Friends, every American needs to go on a little backpacking trip because if you take your children and your grandchildren on a backpacking trip and you say, we're going to live off the land, we're going to live in harmony for three days, Trust me, they will come back and not believe any of this uh, baloney that's being articulated by people who are flying around in Lear jets. How about this? Uh, abortion is obviously in the news. How many of you have heard something about abortion recently? Roe versus Wade, that whole turnover, and, and literally just yesterday, uh, here in the state of Minnesota, and this is happening all across the country, the legislation, uh, Senate, Senate committees were meeting over, you know, opening up abortion here to the most extreme, bizarre, child, <sighs> uh, anyways, horrible. And now watch this. We can have the mailman help us have an abortion. Watch. The FDA's new rule says pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS can now dispense abortion pills as long as they receive a government certification. Pro-life leaders say that is bad news for women. This is a very reckless decision. It was not made with women's health or safety in mind. More than half of the women in the U.S. who choose abortion use the pills, according to the Guttmacher Institute. The FDA maintains that they're safe if used as directed. Still, women who use the pills risk complications, including hemorrhaging, infection, retaining fetal tissue, and cervical damage. One six-year study says abortion pills are four times more dangerous than surgical abortion. Pro-life pregnancy centers say they hear from women using the pills in trouble and unsure what to do. We've already been getting the phone calls from women who have uh, actively aborted uh, their own child at home, uh, where they literally are looking at their aborted child in their palm of their hand and, and calling us and asking, what do I do now? Still, the Biden administration is moving on multiple fronts to allow greater access to the pills. This week, the Justice Department made clear the Postal Service can deliver the pills, even in states that ban them. Is this, is this a political issue? You're a pastor. I mean, when you and I talk about abortion, people yeah. say, you're talking about politics, pastor, you yeah. need to stop that. You know, is this a political issue? No, it's a moral issue, but what's happened is the devil's worked through the church, and so now what you're saying, pastor, is um, a lot of these pastors will not stand up against abortion because they put it in a category of being political. Okay, this is part of the seeker-friendly, the, the Rick Warren church growth movement. Uh, and what it happened in that, in that growth movement is you're not supposed to talk about politics, okay, in this model, okay? So what's happened recently is the moral issues of abortion have been put in the category of political. Israel has been put in the category of political. Uh, gay marriage put in the category of political. So now, the pa when you talk to these pastors, hey, pastor, how come you're not supporting the crisis pregnancy center or the right to life? Oh, that's political. We don't talk like that. Wait a second. You are supposed to talk about it, but they're, they're saying, oh, it's too political and we don't want to do that. And that right there is evil, guys. I can't cut it any other way. Mm -hmm. You're not going to defend 
babies being killed in the womb, or even now outside of the womb, if you're not going to defend against that, I don't know what you're doing. Quit your job and go be a street sweeper or something. But don't be a pastor, because that's a coward. But that's what's happening. They, they have confused categories now on purpose, Mark. That's the issue right there. And did you know in the Didache, which means the teaching, it's a, the first church manual written 150 AD. So it was the guys who had been discipled by the apostles pulling thoughts together on how the church was to function. Specifically states that Christians were against abortion in the first century. This isn't a new issue. The reason it's not a new issue, it's not a political issue. It's a theological issue. Children are made in the image of God, protect life. Amen. Okay, now, having said that, Brandon, when you and I do that, when Jan speaks <laughs> on these issues, we're called and attacked as Christian nationalists. Yeah. And so I just want to show you to a video, and I want you to respond. Is this guy crazy, or is this... Now, I'm not saying this guy's a Christian. I don't know. I haven't personally talked with him, but I want you to see what this guy's saying because he's got a Judeo-Christian worldview and he's communicating it in a setting in the state. Uh, is, this, is this acceptable? I mean, is this okay? Watch this. Benjamin Dore, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee. I come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and on behalf of the members of Minnesota Right to Life Tearing babies in pieces is evil. Ripping their arms and legs off is evil. Stopping their little hearts from beating is evil. Murdering little boys and girls is evil because they are made in the image of God. Minnesota Right to Life and our rapidly growing support base oppose House File 1 and any other abortion bill, and we demand that this committee vote no on this legislation. But we know that you don't care about opinions. God says in Proverbs 8:36 that all those who hate me love death. And that's obvious in this legislation because other so-called pro-life organizations refuse to engage, refuse to spend money at election time, refuse to hold elected legislators accountable for their actions. We can see why you've become unconcerned about political repercussions from the normal pro-life community. But those days are ending. Minnesota Right to Life is not like those organizations. We are ready, willing, and able to expose any politician especially the politically vulnerable ones who vote for this legislation in all future elections. We will never forget this vote, and we will never let the pro-life community forget this vote. Long after the fire has died down over the overturning of Roe versus Wade, Minnesota Right to Life will be in districts across the state exposing politicians for their pro-death votes that cost the lives of countless thousands of unborn babies. We promise. Thank you. Amen. Now, obviously, the, Jesus said, go and preach the gospel. And that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every person needs to trust Christ so that their sins can be forgiven so they can have heaven. But a Judeo-Christian worldview, if it's not infused into the society, I mean, is this wrong or is this right? Man, that, that guy is, he should be a pastor, man, <laughs> because we need more guys like that. But this is the problem. It, and I've talked to you about this, talked to Jim. The out on these guys will say, well, we're just going to preach the gospel. Really? That's, that's code for we're not going to get involved in these issues. Okay? And understand it's code. Our job is to be salt and light. We, we are to confront evil. We're to call it out. We're to warn people. We're to be a watcher on the wall, right? And if you're not going to go out and, and, and hammer evil, we need some guts People like that guy saying, wait, you're evil. What you're doing is evil. And that needs to stop. So, and it's murder. And, 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 and this is our call. And we have to do this. If the pastors are not going to do it, then it's going to have to come from the grassroots. And God bless that guy. And God bless all of you who are fighting as well. You know, my, uh, my eight-year-old grandson was watching television with me. And a president got up and was supporting abortion. And the little guy stood up, put his hand on his hip, and said, hasn't he read the man code? <laughs> Real men protect others. Friends, that's true. And yet you go to these meetings, and men have been silenced 
in this society. Guys, rise to the occasion. Be courageous for Christ. Of course the gospel is absolutely necessary for every lost person. But we Amen. should not allow our children and grandchildren and the children and grandchildren of others be assaulted, dismembered, and abused in this horrible, demonic sort of way. Yeah. Be courageous. Amen. Get the book. Read the book. You can read the chapter. Obviously, there's a president somewhere that hasn't. <laughs> Jan, you've got some questions there. Yeah. We're going to let you start. Well, I'm going to open with a question that's going to be a little bit mildly, I don't want to say touchy, but sensitive. And they say they're watching from Colorado Springs. <clears throat> How should we deal with adult children, um, I'm going to skip a por portion of it, uh, that have Masonic items in their home or room? Is it okay to remove them or just destroy them? I'm just going to make a comment and then a, please. Masonry is demonic. It is totally 100% demonic. You cannot be a Mason and be a Christian. I, I will get hate mail for that. You cannot be. So you need to get rid of anything of Masonry in your home. Please take over. Well, if you study Masonry, uh, Jan's totally right. By like the 15th level or whatever, you renounce all faiths to the great architect of the universe, which is really the all-seeing eye of Satan in the whole thing. It's so satanic, I can't even imagine a Christian would put themselves in that position. But yes, you must remove all objects, and that's the objects we were talking about, such as that. That draws like a magnet, yeah, demonic harassment. So yes, purge your house of that, and be careful of who you're associating with that's involved in that demonic cult. Be very, very careful. Brandon, do you think that the woke movement among churches is part of the great apostasy of the last days? Oh, man, oh, there's yes. no doubt. Uh, wokeism really is Marxism in disguise, uh, right? You know, and so we know that it's coming from that political wing, but it also has the religious elements to it. And really, when you look at wokeism, it's 180-ism. And what I mean by that is it's lawlessness. When you look at the Bible and the spirit of lawlessness, the Antichrist lawless, it means that Evil will always do the opposite of what God does. So if God says this is right, evil says no, it's wrong. If God says this is wrong, evil says this is right. So you get an Isaiah 5 thing where people will call good evil and evil good. Okay, so wokeism does that. It, it reverses, it, it, first of all, it attacks the dominion mandate, says we should have open borders when God wants nations instead of a one world government, right? Wokeism then goes after being made in the image of God by dividing people by racial terms when we all have descended from Adam and Eve, right? And so it, it seeks to divide and counter what God is saying for truth. What does wokeism teach? Don't have babies, save the planet. Don't, don't, and what does the dominion mandate say? Be fruitful and multiply. So everything you see about wokeism, whether it's gay marriage, or identifying as a boy or a girl, whatever, goes against God's program. Hence, the real aspect of this is the whore of Babylon. Babylon, the religious element of Babylon, is now with us now. In different terms, wokeism or whatever you want to call it, but it is the whore. Yep. Be assured that the number one goal of the globalists, again, they're meeting as we speak, is to reduce the world's population. Yep. To get it down to even a few hundred million. Well, my goodness, what? And they have all sorts of schemes to do it. It's part of their agenda that are planning here this current week. Um, here's a good question. What do we do with Christian Bible teachers who are good, uh, yet, uh, good teachers, yet they are teaching at the same time? Is the implication here? They're teaching properly, but they're slipping in teaching on centering prayer, contemplative prayer, the mystical, in other words. Yeah. And, and again, this goes back to, <laughs> we've dealt with this kind of an issue before. There are a lot of pulpits that, that, preach, that preach the gospel that are getting people saved, um, and yet they're slipping things in, out of, I, I believe, out of ignorance. They just don't know that some of the things they're slipping in are demonic, including the mystical the uh, centering prayer, the contemplative prayer, walking the labyrinth. Has anybody here walked the labyrinth in a church? Anybody? 
Not too many. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Brandon, why don't you take that? What, I, yeah. what, how do you deal with a pastor who's preaching the gospel, preaching a solid gospel, but doesn't get what we're talking about? Yeah, when you bring in uh, pagan practices like that, that's pretty dangerous. Yeah. And, and what I would say is, first of all, you have to go to the pastor and talk to them and expose what they're doing, say, hey, did you know this? That's your first thing to do. Now, here's the thing. You're going to look for the reaction. And if that pastor's was saying, wow, I really messed up on that, and I need to, I need to do some studying on that, and great, that's a big win, because he's willing to address it and, and correct it. But his reaction is, you're crazy, you, I don't know where you got this. You, got, you probably got this from Brandon Holthouse or Jan Markell. That's where you got this from. And, and I don't, you know, he's crazy. If you get that reaction, you're now unequally yoked. Even though they might be teaching basic Bible teachings that are correct, they've opened the door to the occult. And here's the thing. Once the occult door is open, it doesn't stay this little crack. It widens yeah the longer you go with it. So before you know it, they're doing centering prayer. The next thing you, they're going to be doing is Christian tarot cards. Yeah. That's the nature of how it works. So approach it, and if you don't get the right reaction, go on our church track or try to find another church. Yeah, try to find another church. You know, I think, Jan, there's another element to that. I think, sadly, spiritual leaders... And not just spiritual leaders. I mean, it's not just pastors. You've got to understand a lot of things come to pastors through people in their church. But it's a low view of Scripture. Hmm. You see, it says in the Bible, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God, the woman of God, might be adequately equipped for every good work. You don't need to add to the Bible. You don't need to go and find something in psychology or something from Eastern mysticism. Today, all of that is modern Gnosticism. Yeah, great. Yeah. You read through the New Testament, and they keep bringing up this idea, this, this, this knowledge, this, this gnosko that you've got to have, this knowledge you've got to have. And that's exactly the same thing. And it's the introduction of lies by Satan to destroy the church. It happened in the church of, of Colossae, the, the Lycus Valley, those churches, all through the New Testament, nothing has changed. Why? Because there's only two kingdoms. God's kingdom, Satan's kingdom, and Satan is still attacking God's kingdom and using these things. Jan, last question is yours. What's the last question you have? There? Okay, uh, and I want you both to address this, please. And the question is, with one-third of pastors, only one-third, having a biblical worldview, what are the questions I should ask to know I'm at a solid church. We're going to do a radio program on that here in the next two, three months. How do you know when it's time to leave a church? What do you see? And how can you, uh, what kind of questions do you ask to, in finding a new church? But again, with only a third of pastors having a biblical worldview based on the uh, pew, it was either pew or Barna, uh, what are the questions I should ask to know I'm at a solid church? Why don't you start and why don't you finish? Okay. You know, bottom line is this. Do they have a big view of Jesus Christ? I mean, who do you say Jesus is? Because Satan, whenever that question comes up, it will always be a Jesus other than the Jesus of the Bible. It'll be the Jesus of your own imagination. The Jesus, Jesus is just one of the many great teachers. Jesus is just one of a great moral teacher. They'll always degrade Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God who became flesh, died on a cross, rose again the third day, paid the penalty so that you and I might have a relationship with God, and when you believe in him, you're a new creature, and therefore you've been transferred to another kingdom, and so now everything changes. And if it hasn't changed, friends, something's wrong. And then the question is, so do they have a big view of you, Jesus? And that's going to tell you whether or not they have a big view of the Bible. Because the only way you have a big view of, view of Jesus is we have a big view of the Bible. In other words, the Word of God is authoritative for life in practice. You know, people used to say that as Christians. Pastors used to say that. They don't say that much anymore. But you go back through history, great pastors, great spiritual leaders, they always had a high view of Christ. Why? They had a high view of the Bible. 
Jesus said to the Pharisees and the scribes, you read the scriptures thinking in them you will find eternal life, but in them you will discover me. And so I always just come back to Jesus, come back to the Bible, come back to justification by faith, then come back and look at specifically godliness. Because when Jesus talks about them, you will know them by their fruit. I mean, the morality of the world is not the morality of God. And so if there is a rationalization regarding uh, sexuality, regarding you know, some of these things we've talked about tonight, I'm just telling you, it's not a, it's not a good place. And you want to be in a, the strongest place possible, friends. Draw near to the Lord. Brandon, Amen. pick up from there. What question should I ask to know that I'm in a solid church? We have got this experience from dealing with churches for our church tracker. Sure, right. So I'm going to speak from how we are noticing things out there. First of all, the attitude of the pastor. Okay, Before I go into any theological questions, I want to know his attitude. The first attitude is this. Will you disclose to me what you believe? Because if the pastor is, is reticent to not do that or whatever, he sh he's hiding something. What do you believe on soteriology? What do you believe on Christology? What do you believe on the Trinity? And, well, we, we want to be open and we want to, you know, have all y'all come type of mentality. So I really don't want to be pigeonholed and I don't want to be labeled and I don't want to be categorized. That's the sign right there. Because if you know what you believe, you say, yeah, I'm dispensational, pre-trib, pre-millennial, I'm non-Calvinistic, I'm not Arminian, I'm, 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 uh, I believe in a future of Israel, boom, 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 I should be able to knock it off. Mm -hmm. And say, hey, tater chip, let it rip, you like that or not? Well, okay, maybe I'm not the right church. <laughs> but at the end of the day, if you start, you start to play coy, well, you know that. Well, first of all, attitude. Second, I want to know on their, their, their website, do they have a good statement of faith on that website if it's i love jesus that's they're telling you something they're hiding something okay so if i get a pastor and we've we've dealt with it our staff have dealt with these pastors okay pastor here's what i want to know where are you at on soteriology what do you mean explain to me how one gets saved and let him tell you how someone gets saved. You'll be shocked that many pastors can't even tell a person how they get saved. Well, you just got to love Jesus. Really, I thought it was by faith alone. You know, you start going through that. And then they'll add in good works, and boom, they tell you. What do you believe about Israel? Let him tell you. If he has no opinion, that's a problem. What do you believe about um, uh, dispensationalism? Okay, he should know that. If the guy tells you, I don't agree with dispensationalism, dispensationalism, okay, pastor, then what do you believe? Because why am I asking the question of dispensationalism? I'm trying to get to the dude's hermeneutic. I want to know how he interprets the Bible. And if he will say, I'm covenant or I'm reformed, then I know how he interprets eschatology. He will spiritualize it or allegorize it. Amen. You must pin him down on, on his hermeneutic. Because they'll say, well, how do you view apocalyptic literature? Well, apocalyptic literature is like poems, and we just don't know, and we just don't know. It'll all pan out. Uh-uh. Yeah. You get away from that. So you go do those things, and you pin the pastor down. If he knows what he believes, he'll tell you. If he doesn't, and he's playing games with you, that's when you leave. He's hiding something. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing sometimes. So, yeah, anyway. Very good. Thank Give you. Give these two a hand, would you? Thank you. Well, hey, just, just really quick, I just wanted to just kind of want to pull thing, some things together. Um, you know, the world says that there are many paths to God. Just pick a path. Just be sincere. Just be yourself. It's okay. We're all going to make it. But do you know what Jesus said? He said there's only two paths. There's a wide path. It's, it's like the 405 freeway in Southern California. Six <laughs> lanes of gridlock all right and everybody's on it they're shaving they're putting on their makeup it's it's something to see and then Jesus says there's the broad road that leads to destruction and then there's this narrow road and he says this is the road that leads to life and then he says 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father, no one gets to heaven, but through me. And so my question to you in closing tonight is this. Are you on the broad road or the narrow road? Now, get this. We all come in on that broad road. If you don't know where you're at, that's a good indication you're on the broad road. Now, many, I know, we'll come back to the broad road in just one second. I know many of you got off the broad road. You took the off-ramp. The little off-ramp that nobody wanted, but the off-ramp that leads to life. You trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you can listen to all these things tonight, and you're like, oh, what am I going to walk away with and do tonight? Well, I want to point your attention to that passage up there. Because there's two action points to these Christians in the first century that are applicable to us. Notice it says there, um, you turned to God from idols. Friends, all of us worshipped idols before we worshipped Jesus. Because everything that we sought and lived for was an idol. Thank heavens you got off the broad road and you trusted Christ. But it goes on. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. There's two things I want you to notice there. To serve the living God. What am I supposed to do as I leave tonight? As I'm watching this later on YouTube or whatever. Do this. Serve God with all of your heart in these last days. Be courageous. Be obedient. Draw near to God. Seek him with all of your heart. Daniel did it in Babylon. You can do it in America. You can do it in the rest of the world. Seek the Lord. Serve him with all of your heart. Do it with zealous. Do it with devotion. The world needs, quite honestly, to see that in you. And then secondly, it's right there in the passage, wait. Wait. Don't give up. Don't stop talking about Jesus. You got to wait. Be persistent. Be, be patient because Jesus is coming. And you say, it's so hard. All my friends are doing this. I, I just recently had a 30-year-old saying, you know, all my friends have embraced this ideology, this sexuality, and I'm just so tired. I just, I just can't resist anymore. Yes, you can. Because there's perseverance in the Holy Spirit to those who are serving God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and waiting for whom? We're waiting for Jesus. We're waiting for Jesus. And you know what? He's going to deliver us from the wrath to come. Friends, the world is talking about safe. I mean, John Kerry yesterday said he's in a room with some of his rich little buddies, and they're going to save the world. Really? Really? John Kerry, you can't even save yourself? And you're going to save the world? Really? I mean, how arrogant and insane is that? He even went on and said, you know, this kind of sounds like little Martian things that you might, yeah, you're a Martian. Okay. Friends, if you're on the narrow road and you're following Jesus, listen, serve him faithfully right now and wait patiently. Jesus is going to rescue us from this mess. We all, Jan and I talk about the mess. Brandon talks about the mess all the time. Serve Jesus faithfully. Wait for his son. Now, maybe you're on the broad road. Listen, it's time to take the off-ramp. And you say, well, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. Just so you know, Jesus is coming and it's going to be abrupt when he comes. He's going to take the church out all of a sudden. People are going to be saying, oh, Jesus, maybe another day. I, I live north of here. And when you're, when you're going down the freeway there, um, if you don't take the right off-ramp, it's seven miles before the next off-ramp. I'm just telling you, if you don't get the off-ramp at the right time, it's a seven mile, or seven years in this case, of tribulation. You don't want to miss the off-ramp. Tonight, take the off-ramp. Today, take the off-ramp. You say, how do I do that? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came and he died on a cross. He paid for sins. It's the only provision for our sins, so that your sins, so that my sin might be forgiven, so we might be reconciled to God. And 150 times in the New Testament, it says one thing. Just do this. Just believe in him. What does that mean? It means you got to know that you're sinful, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for sins. He rose again. That's how we know he's the Son of God. 
You got to know that. Secondly, you got to embrace that mentally. And then thirdly, there has to be a moment in time. Tonight's the night. Today's the day where you say, I trust in Jesus and him alone to save me. And if that's your desire tonight, why don't you express that in prayer with me right now? Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that you have brought us together tonight. And Lord, we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the one who's coming in glory, power, and majesty, the one who is going to uh, bind Satan for a thousand years, the one who is going to throw him eventually into the lake of fire, that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, friends, while your heads are bowed, if you're on that broad road, you're not sure you're going to heaven, you're not sure that you have eternal life, listen, you need to trust Christ right now. Believe in him. The best you know how, I believe, personalize it, I believe in Jesus, the Son of God, Savior of the world, he died for me. I trust in him. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross to pay for my sin. And the best I know how right now, Jesus, I trust in you as Lord God and Savior. God, hear our prayers. Help us to be faithful until the end. Father, we confess that we are waiting for your son, Jesus, who will deliver us from the wrath to come. We pray this in his name. Amen. Hey, friends, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and fill you with peace. Jesus, Redeemer, mighty to save. You are the love song we'll sing.